Well, welcome everybody to HydroTerra's latest webinar. Today's topic is managing arsenic in post-mining environments, getting our rehabilitation right. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Dane Lamb, who's Senior Lecturer in Environmental Engineering from RMIT University, presenting to us today. The sort of core focus of this topic is really around the uh, potential for revegetation and, and application of organic materials to these wastes to actually inadvertently mobilise some of the contaminants within that waste, for example, well, in particular in this one, arsenic. So it's uh, it's an interesting topic because um, we're all passionate about revegetating mine sites. Before we get started, I would like to begin by acknowledging that we conduct our work across this great land, and for that privilege, we would like to thank the traditional owners. Hydroterra respectfully acknowledges the Boon Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation, where we are located today, and we pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. There's a picture of Dane. Thanks for joining us today, Dane. Thank you. Thanks for having me. A little bit about Dane. So Dane Lamb is the Senior Lecturer in Environmental Engineering at RMIT University in Melbourne. With over 15 years of experience in trace element geochemistry, bioavailability and ecotoxicology. He has authored over 100 publications and is recognised for his research on environmental geochemistry and metalloid behaviour in soil plant systems. He is the lead investigator of projects focused on plant-mediated mineral transformation of iron arsenic mineral phases. His current research focuses on advancing our understanding of environmental risks associated with arsenic contamination, particularly in organically enriched systems. So a very strong emphasis on soil chemistry and the like today in this presentation. As most of you know, we love your questions and um, for you to raise those questions, you use the Q&A button at the top of your screen. If you record those questions, I will read them out and Dane will do his best to answer them. Why does HydroTerra do these webinars? Well, we think there's a need to share knowledge. We like to help facilitate to do that and we like to take an industry leadership position. So without further ado, I will hand over to Dane. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for the introductions. Uh, so as Richard mentioned, my interest at the moment um, is diverse, but one of the primary focuses is really on arsenic geochemistry and particularly in, in mining environments. Next slide. So as many of us know, uh, mining has a lot of benefits uh, to our society as a central part. Uh, however, both current mining practices and previous mining practices have well well documented and well known um, environmental issues, and one of those that has uh, persisted uh, essentially throughout any mining activities is the production and fugitive release of arsenic um, in and around mining operations. It's a current issue, certainly for current mining operations that are regulating their waste correctly and uh, and, and generally. Uh, is well done, but still it is uh, something that persists in, in our mining tailings and some of our waste for rock material. Similarly, and uh, probably a, some of the bigger issues that we have relating to arsenic is the our previous mine uh, or our legacy mine environments where before uh, environmental regulations were what they are today, they were, arsenic unfortunately was released more Carelessly is probably a correct word to be used. Um, and a lot of these sites are still uh, requiring significant 
uh, management. And that that is essentially a global issue, uh, but we see it essentially in every state and territory across Australia, uh, from Fort Victoria, um, which is nearby here. Uh, lots of mining, gold mining occurred, releasing substantial amounts of arsenic, but essentially across the world as well. So it's a it's an issue that we come across quite commonly, um, and there we really need to have um, effective management strategies for for arsenic that are is is occurring in these sorts of mining environments and and non mining environments as well. Next slide. So. What we see, particularly in mining environments, is a strong association uh, with arsenic with iron minerals. Uh, this is not exclusively the case. However, it is frequently observed that how iron mineralogy changes has a really strong link to what's happening with arsenic. If, if, we, if we can see that iron is being mobilised, it, there tends to be a very high likelihood that arsenic is going to be mobilised, um, at least in, in parallel. And this also goes quite hand in hand with the source of arsenic. So as, as a generalisation, which is not always the case, however, in general, the iron and acidity that's being produced from, from pyrites also is associated with arsenic, whether that be uh, arsenic that is in a pure mineral form, such as an arsenopyrite, or arsenic that has been included um, or substituted into other pyrite type materials. When the pyrite gets oxidized, this has a tendency to release um, arsenic in various forms into, into the environment. And once released, that's not the end of the iron arsenic uh, interaction. We also expect to see arsenic being controlled to a large extent by different chemical reactions occurring with iron oxides. And these include adsorption processes, resubstitution or isomorphic substitution reactions. Um, and importantly, and this is particularly relevant in, in mining environments where we have very high iron and, and arsenic concentrations, the formation of pure iron uh, arsenic minerals. Uh, again, this is very much the typical, what we would typically expect. However, we also have to expect that in an environment, it's not exclusively the case and still aluminium, manganese oxides, and even some carbonates may have an influence. Next slide. So some of those really key minerals uh, that occur in these mining sites have the potential uh, to be able to chemically stabilize arsenic. Uh, and some of those some of those minerals, and probably the most commonly uh, researched one is uh, essentially a ferric arsenate, so oxidized iron and oxidized arsenic uh, precipitating as a mineral called scorodite or ferric arsenate. Uh, so this is one that is fairly commonly seen and has, again, been really researched as a potential way of chemically stabling, uh, chemically stabilizing arsenic. However, we can chemically stabilize arsenic, whether naturally or artificially, by increasing the amount of iron and different types of iron. So we also expect to find arsenic adsorbed into a range of other minerals. Now, if this is a sulfate-rich uh, environment at a relatively low pH, this may include a mineral uh, that's important in AMD environments called schwermanite. It may also be associated with some jarosites as a co-precipitate. And one that uh, we frequently see is, in fact, a lead arsenic jarosite, which tends to be uh, get the name called budentite. So these are... All of these are primarily, but not exclusively, arsenic-5 species, so arsenic that has been oxidised and has reached the uh, essentially the highest oxidation state in the environment. And this has a, tends to have a pretty strong relationship with iron minerals. It tends to be a negatively charged uh, anion, um, and again, is tends to be 
be associated with a lower toxicity to human and ecological receptors. On the flip side of this is the reduced forms of arsenic. Typically, uh, we, we're talking about arsenite, which is arsenic-3. Uh, this is a, mineral, a particular species that also will adsorb as probably the primarily primary way of reducing the solubility of, of arsenic, um, but it primarily in most pHs is existing as a neutrally charged iron. So it tends to be not as attracted to iron and other metal oxyhydroxide phases. And in contrast to the arsenic-5 uh, species, it, it tends to be associated less with any pure mineral phases, apart from, and one of the few that's been identified, is the mineral on the bottom called toluite, which is similar to schwermonite being a ferric arsenic uh, hydroxysulfate mineral. Next slide. Just before we do, Dane, so <clears throat> sort of intrigued by this comment about rice fields up uh, near the top there. Yep. Um, so is arsenic a big issue in rice growing areas or so. it is it's a uh, globally it is is a big is a big issue this is definitely mostly associated with areas in bangladesh where there has been extensive enrichment um soluble enrichment water soluble enrichment of arsenic in the groundwater which is unfortunately being used on a day-to-day -day basis across large areas of bangladesh um and we're talking about impacts to uh, community, well, population of Bangladesh in the sort of 10 to 20 million range, um, which is clearly, it's a well-documented uh, situation, um, but they use this uh, arsenic-rich water for their day-to-day -day activities, and that includes irrigation for rice fields, includes drinking, uh, et cetera. But it is not the only country, and certainly by far it's not the only country that has issues associated with iron and arsenic. And really, in the world of arsenic, this is by far the most studied. Uh, as important as arsenic is in, in mining, uh, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but I would expect that publications in this area would be outnumber most uh, due, to the, due to the high impact on communities around the world. It also has, it's also very interesting scientifically due to the variable redox environment of, of rice paddy fields. Yeah. And the fact, of course, that some billions of people in the world are relying on, on rice as a staple in, the, in their diet. And the water as well. <laughs> the water as well, exactly. All right, I'll move to the next slide. Thank you. So why, I think I've partially answered uh, this question already, why are iron arsenic minerals important? So as mentioned, a lot of the time, arsenic behaviour is being at, at least not entirely controlled by iron geochemistry. It's at least associated with iron geochemistry. Um, and that means that whether an iron arsenic mineral is precipitating or not, means that it can be either behaving as a sink, which is definitely what we would like, so taking uh, soluble arsenic out of the environment. Um, but if we have secured or uh, chemically stabilised arsenic in a, as an iron arsenate or iron arsenite type mineral, um, and we don't manage that situation into the future uh, correctly, then it may potentially be a, an ongoing source uh, of arsenic um, in the future. And so it's important to understand what we can and can't do um, with, with iron arsenic minerals due to the unfortunate high susceptibility to changes in redox and pH. So in terms of our management um, of these post-management sites, and essentially I'm focusing more on the legacy mine or abandoned mine type environments here, given that most modern mines are managing their arsenic and tend to be securing any um, contaminated mine tailings in a, in a managed uh, tailings uh, facility. Uh, so what we're mostly talking about here are potential operations that we could do um, to, met, to look after a contaminated site, and that could be related to processes of oxidative dissolution, which is essentially 
allow an arsenic, uh, iron arsenic minerals to exist on the surface, uh, either reburying it or uh, allowing flooding to occur on a site, which would induce uh, potentially reductive dissolution of these stable minerals, um, and also phytostabilization or revegetation of those sites. Next slide. So just before we do, so when we're considering a mine site rehabilitation, um, the ability for us to actually control, you know, what those redox conditions and things are like into the futures, we're sort of assuming we're going to create a stable enough setting that they won't change. Is that what you're saying? Yes, that's right. So if it's in a surface environment, yes, we definitely would would try to limit uh, any flooding of those those areas, and that would typically be done by engineering water flow uh, and limiting flooding in those areas. Um, but similarly, if you if there is already existing reducing conditions, um, and we know that there are some minerals such as iron sulfides or arsenic sulfides potentially controlling the arsenic chemistry, then we also need to make sure that the conditions stay reducing to keep those minerals chemically stable. Uh, What's the kinetics like on this? So, you know, you change, you have a, have a weird season and suddenly you don't have a wet cover on, um, like, how long do you have to manage it? Like, can you go back a year later and things won't have reacted much or...? Uh, well, iron two oxidation depend. It's, it's pH dependent. Uh, iron two oxidation following a flooding event is very very fast above a pH of five. So we're talking seconds to minutes generally for the, for that to occur. Mm -hmm. um, there are big differences in whether we're talking chemical oxidation or microbially induced oxidation and re and reduction. Uh, so in general, we are looking at weeks to weeks um, once flooding occurs, and this is primarily driven by uh, bacteria, which are taking re uh, oxidants out of out of out of the system uh, for their to 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 exist basically. Um, so yeah, it, no, you definitely don't have years. But we're really talking weeks, right? Okay, I'll it's a you. very uh, complicated answer. Whoever you know, there's so yeah, yeah. a lot of scenarios involved in that. So to to reiterate um, those three chemical processes that we're interested in here, um, so once we have a potential formation of a ferric arsenic mineral, there are different treatments that could occur. Again, reduction by burial, reburial, or creating of a reducing conditions. Uh, there's a potential natural attenuation, which essentially would be ongoing oxidation of these minerals and uh, questions about their long-term stability. And uh, finally, if, and which is quite common in uh, these sorts of environments to rehabilitate by uh, either revegetation uh, or phytostabilization approaches. So, the ones that have been researched far more extensively uh, to date for most iron arsenic minerals is oxidation and reduction processes. Um, but to a lesser extent, it's uh, unclear how plant and plant communities may or may not influence iron arsenic geochemistry. So in those uh, phytostabilization systems, what we're really interested in is how plants will introduce more organic materials um, into, into essentially the rhizosphere. Um, and these rhizospheres are quite complicated and it depends on numerous factors and certainly the, the plant species and types of plant communities that are going to be growing there, um, but also the microbial community that's associated and directly linked with those, um, those plant communities. Uh, the primary exudates that are of interest are essentially carboxylates. So we're talking citric acid, oxalate, um, or ascorbic acid uh, type compounds. However, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of those compounds in a 
within an ecosystem being released, but there are other materials as well. Um, and these tend to be something along the lines of phytosiderophores, but also a range of carbohydrates such as sugars, amino acids, and even proteins being released into this environment, which makes it a highly complicated uh, system uh, to, to study. So some of the work that we've been doing over a number of years now and from a number of people involved, and I'll acknowledge them at the end of the slide, is um, essentially looking at those three different areas and how some particularly arsenic-3 minerals can be influenced uh, by those processes. So the first that we've really looked at is the oxic dissolution. So under oxygenated conditions, um, and this is, we're looking at the mineral toluite, which again is an arsenic-3, uh, iron-3 mineral, but also another interesting mineral that we see quite commonly, especially in uh, streams and wetland systems, which is called schwermanite, which is stoichiometrically quite similar, um, but also can incorporate arsenic-5 and arsenic-3. And what we wanted to do was have a look at how a model root exudate would influence the mobility and potential mineral transformations of these two minerals. So we have essentially three systems, uh, three types of organic systems here, and that's no citric acid, a medium level of uh, citric acid, which has a carbon ion ratio of two, and, and also 20 at a pH three, six and eight. And essentially this is a batch reaction system over 80 days. Um, and following each reaction, we measure the arsenic ion um, and at select days, the mineralogy. Next slide. So to talk about toluite uh, first, so this is the data that we've gathered over the first 80 days of our experiment at each of those three oxic conditions that might, may exist. And on the top, we can see arsenic, and on the bottom, we can see uh, iron. So what we can see here is clearly a relatively slow kinetics. Um, in this case, that's a previous question, um, Richard. And this is a little bit similar to what we see for jarosites, which can take hundreds of hundreds of days, if not longer, to reach some sort of equilibrium or st a steady state. Um, and but what's important here is two things. And what we can see is essentially a one-to-one -one ratio of approximately of arsenic to iron dissolution. And that's across each of those systems. Um, but we can see a, a very substantial expansion on arsenic solubilization as we increase, increase the amount of uh, citric acid. Um, and this is expressed as a unit, which is probably a little bit unfamiliar, but we're talking about very high concentrations uh, of solubilization. Um, but to be fair as well, we are also using in the iron ratio of 20, very high concentration of citric acid. Um, and what we can see here is that toluite in a, in, under the influence of citric acid is relatively, uh, the solubility is expanded is, it, to a very, very high extent, where we're talking about around a 50, per six, 50 to 60 percent solubilization um, in our highest treatment. Dane, if you just looked at a most rehabilitated sites, I suppose, with you know decent vegetation cover, I mean, this concentration of citric acid that you've sort of admitted is pretty high. Um, what what would typically you know, around the root zone on, on a given site, what would we be normally looking at? Like on a well... Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. Uh, it really depends on how you look at that. So if some studies, if you look through literature, will show probably only in the range of 50 to maybe at a high end, a couple of hundred micromole of citric acid or root exudates. However, if you model that... Um, in terms of how much may be associated closer to the mineral surfaces, we're talking about much higher concentrations. Uh, but what we're trying to do here, and so the, probably the more realistic one that we can see here is our iron carbon to iron ratio of two. Um, but we really wanted to try and 
unravel how citric acid um, would influence it from essentially the minimum um, to to a, a quite a high level. Okay. Next slide. Yep. So we were also interested in how organic matter, um, so whether that be a compost or a biosolid, uh, or just natural organic matter being introduced into one of these post mining environments, which previously may or may not have been low in organic matter, um, and how that might influence uh, telluric behaviour as well. Um, and this is particularly interesting because unlike citric acid at normal temperatures, uh, which probably doesn't have a much of a uh, reductive dissolution process, humic acid has the potential to influence uh, dissolution through electron transfer reactions as well, but it's also a very common form of organic matter that we may, may exist. So what we can see here is something that's at the low amounts of humic acid that we've introduced into the system, a certainly an increase in the solubilization of arsenic, um, and that's that is increased the more humic acid that we add due to primarily complexation reactions is is the most likely scenario. But what's different with humic acid uh, compared to the citric acid is that the ratio of arsenic to iron is not is not close to one to one. You can see uh, certainly for the higher pH as we increase the humic acid into the, the system, what we're having is a preferential release, um, so not a completely congruent dissolution process uh, as that organic matter increases. So this is likely to be due to iron essentially reforming a new mineral or potentially staying adsorbed or complex to the, the humic acid material. But what's really important here is that both humic acid and citric acid had a substantial influence on the release of arsenic. Next slide, please. Um, and so one of the other minerals, and we'll quickly go through this, was a schwertmanite. And this schwertmanite by itself has no arsenic in its, in its purest form. Um, but schwertmanite is well known for being able to incorporate lots of chemicals and particularly metals and metalloids into its structure via substitution processes. And uh, what we can see here is it follows a relatively similar process as, as, um, as toolite, but this is a little bit different because the arsenic content here is substantially lower because it's just a co-precipitation uh, or adsorption type reaction, uh, but it follows a very similar trait. Um, but unlike toluite, the arsenic in the Schwertmanite was far more um, resilient, whether it had high citric acid or not. And we see it only around at the after 80 days, only around 25% of the, even in the highest citric acid treatment being solubilized, indicating the arsenic is existing in a form that's far more resilient to to citric acid attack. Next slide. So we're very much interested in how the mineralogy will change that and, and how what's really governing these processes, um, controlling those arsenic releases. So what we have done with most of that, the data that we've generated so far has used uh, synchrotron facilities. Um, so these just to briefly mention what these are. These are essentially relatively rare uh, facilities. In Australia, we have one, which is here in Melbourne. Most countries, aside from the US, also only have one, if they have any. Um, but what these are, are essentially high energy or high phytone environments that really allow us to probe uh, the iron and arsenic speciation and sulfur speciation uh, of these minerals or, the, or in these systems regardless of whether they are crystalline or highly crystalline, whether they're mineral forms or they're organic forms. So they're highly adaptable and really essentially the best that we can use to probe these, these types of changes in iron arsenic chemistry. Next. So what we found from our 
uh, I and uh, XAF's XAF data was that in the case of toluite, we in this in the citric acid reactions, what we found was that essentially most of the iron retained the the essentially the iron coordination environment that is started with for toluite. So one, unlike a lot of minerals such as scorodite um, and amorphous ferric arsenate and other other minerals, toluite under oxy conditions primarily has the tendency to uh, to essentially to dissolve congruently, and that means it doesn't trans tends to not transform into different minerals following dissolution. Uh, and that's important because if we know that arsenic is being controlled by toluite, we should be able to predict that better than a more complicated uh, mineral system. This differs, however, a little bit uh, with, with our humic acid system. In our high humic acid system, this was not the case. Um, and we're still trying to, at this point, resolve how the iron and arsenic speciation really changed in this system. But it's most currently, we believe that most of the iron um, reformed a some kind of adsorbed uh, species. And because organic matter really doesn't adsorb much arsenic, if any, uh, the arsenic stayed released, whereas the iron got uh, pulled out of solution. And only in rare cases did we see uh, a small amount of scorodite form. Next slide, thanks. Quite different uh, to toluite. What we found and what's really interesting was that our arsenic-3 uh, precipitated Schwertmanite uh, had a very high tendency to transform in incongruently we say, but basically into different types of minerals over time. So what we can see here is that regardless of the organic system, this uh, modified Schwertmanite substantially uh, had its structure disrupted uh, and those transformation pathways tended to head towards um, a diverse mineral series. And that essentially was heading towards a arsenic-5 co-precipitated ferrihydrite, which is indicated here by ferrihydrite, um, and, and if not an arsenic-5 precipitated ferrihydrite, something along the lines of a uh, just a pure ferrihydrite, which then has the ability to adsorb um, a large extent. Um, and this is makes our life a lot more complicated because those mineral transformation processes now become quite complicated um, over time. Next slide, please. To continue on with the more complicated systems, uh, we also in, have investigated the re reductive dissolution, and this, this work has been published a couple of years ago um, by Grish Chopala, and the citation is listed there. So in this system, what we were interested in is what happens to, in particular, toluite under these reducing conditions. Um, and so what we've uh, what's happened here is we've added under reducing conditions iron 2 at different concentrations, and then had a look again at how this influenced mineral transformation um, and arsenic solubility. And what we can see here is that as we add iron 2, the extent of arsenic mobilization also increases. Um, and that's occurring because under reducing conditions, iron 2 is essentially reducing our, our iron-3 based mineral, um, toluite based iron-3, and that's solubilizing arsenite into the solution. Next slide, please. And again, this works far more complete. It's all been published as mentioned. So we can see here that unlike under oxy conditions, uh, toluite tends to transform incongruently, and we find fairly substantial transformation of 2 ferrihydrite, and this becomes the secondary mineral control of, of arsenic in these systems. And it's in this case, it's primarily arsenic-3, arsenic-3-adsorbed um, toluite, um, and that's 
as, as we would expect um, under most systems, very hydrate is an extremely reactive mineral and very good scavenger of, of arsenic. So, Dane, just in the world of um, toxicity and that side of things, something like that last compound you referred to, or ferrohydrite, is that more dangerous than the compound it started with? Or ferrohydrite's not. It's um, it's a quite a common common mineral that we find throughout the throughout soil sediment environments. Um, but it's super important in, in most chemical systems for their, its ability to scavenge and adsorb um, chemicals from the from solution. So they're very potent uh, adsorber of chemicals, especially arsenic. Yeah. But I'm just thinking from a rehabilitation perspective, a transformation like that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, missing the point. No, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Again, because ferrohydrite is a very good adsorber of arsenic, it, it's also immobilizing some of the release. But under these reducing conditions, it's not sufficient to, to recover the arsenic that's being released. Right. It's also not a particularly stable mineral, but um, yeah, better move on to the... So the next uh, question that we're really interested in is, okay, so what happens if we do phytostabilize or revegetate some of these mining environments where we have a ferric arsenic type mineral? So what we uh, did was conducted some short-term experiments where we used plants that had different root rhizosphere environments. And these are referred to as iron strategy one, which are typically dicots and iron strategy two. And these plants differ because they have different strategies and release different root exudates to try and acquire more iron um, from the environment. And this is particularly linked with certainly iron nutrition for the plant, but also phosphorus nutrition. Uh, and this is really important uh, in a plant system that we have an iron and an arsenic system, uh, because particularly in the case of arsenate, uh, the, the phosphate system is in fact very similar to is, is how arsenate is incorporated into a plant. So a plant that is act, actively trying to acquire phosphorus is also going to be have the tendency to be acquiring more iron by upregulating those processes. But what we're really interested in is how those processes may or may not influence um, the iron, iron arsenic chemistry. Next slide. So in this case, we've used a native plant, which is uh, well known for its ability to release a lot of carboxylates. Uh, and we also have wheat, which is our iron acquisition strategy number two. And we have a control which had no plants. And we were also interested in how, with and without humic acid, how that influenced our arsenic geochemistry. And that's a picture of the cluster root system of uh, Hackia prostrata. Next slide, please. An interesting looking root system, isn't it? It is very interesting. <laughs> so the short uh, answer to what happened was what we found was that both plant species were able to uh, influence the two, two light um, stability. Um, and using arsenic excess, we found that in contrast to those oxic conditions um, systems, what we found is that the arsenic and chemical environment tend to be not as congruent as the as what we found in the purely oxic system. So next slide, please. Um, and so what we can see here is in under the humic acid system, um, our our wheat, which is our iron acquisition strategy number two, tended to promote the transformation over a two-week study uh, of toluite to uh, ferrohydrite, uh, and that consisted of a combination of arsenic-3 and arsenic-5 adsorbed ferrohydrite in these systems. Um, but when we added humic acid, 
that also, as we saw um, in the oxic dissolution process, showed that uh, humic acid had the ability to transform those minerals quite effectively, but it appeared to limit how much of the arsenic-3 was being oxidized, most likely in solution. And it was what we found was that it was essentially being reabsorbed um, onto the ferrohydrate without the oxidation. And this may be due to, of course, having a much more electron-rich material existing um, in the in the root environment that uh, limited um, the oxidation processes for arsenic-5. Slide, please. Uh, and so of interest to us is what also happened in terms of the, the, the carbon and what was happening in the chemistry, what was really influencing those processes. And what we can see is that, of course, the plants were responding quite dramatically to the arsenic that's being released from tulite, which is in the PPM concentration. Um, and in both cases, both wheat and hackia released very large concentrations of carbohydrate into, into the rhizosphere. And this would have the influence, impact of really promoting the bacterial community that was would have almost certainly been also existing in this system. And the control is also very likely to have bacteria community living there. But as we can see, that plant um, root exudate system is really driving very large changes in the, in the rhizosphere. And uh, this, alongside some of the uh, root exudates, in particular malic acid, uh, was, is most likely influencing um, what's happening with our iron arsenic geochemistry. So next slide, please. So what's the importance of this information? So what we were trying to do is really get some fundamental understanding of how each of those different systems were really controlling um, uh, what happens with iron and arsenic. Um, and we can see that, especially for a tulite, but this doesn't apply to other minerals such as scorodite and, uh, and shwerpenite, uh, it tended to dissolve very congruently under the oxic system. And this is kind of a useful bit of information to know because we can then model what impacts arsenic may be having on the environment. But we can certainly see that putting our oxic minerals back into a reducing environment um, with or without uh, the presence of root exudates is really going to have a big influence on what's happening uh, with our arsenic mobility. Um, and uh, certainly we can see that even in the short-term study, that the, the influence uh, that a microbial or a plant community will have on the long-term of fate of these ferric uh, arsenite uh, host mineral phases is very strongly and will probably very strongly controlled by what kind of plant communities that we, we you'll be growing. Um, and in our case, wheat was the plant species that tended to promote that the most. Um, but that may be relating to other factors, not just our, not just the pure phytoacidophores that were being released from wheat, which would not have been being released um, from our hackia. But thank you. It, it does raise questions about plant selection for rehabilitation. I'm just sort of wondering. Um, you've mentioned that a lot of Australian plants have adapted to sort of iron-rich, phosphorus-depleted environments. Um, if I was doing a mine rehabilitation, I wanted to select a plant that's going to survive. Mm. You might be choosing one that's actually also optimised for leading to increased arsenic mobility, wouldn't you? Or have I misunderstood that? If it's a phytostabilisation approach... Uh, probably you want to pick a plant species that's not going to mobilize it. Uh, but if you want to try and hyperaccumulate, so you know, a much more active remediation approach, then yes, you would you would like to pick a plant that's really good at um, acquiring iron and, and arsenic from the system. Um, but it's a it's a, it's a complicated system. Um, 
And uh, I think that would take a considerable amount of work. And really, um, one of the unfortunate and kind of unusual aspects of this is it's a it's even most common gardeners in the backyard gardeners in Australia know that Australian natives typically don't like to have much phosphorus and have like unique systems for acquiring phosphorus from the system. And yet, um, in the literature, there's essentially there's very little published data anyhow on how Australian natives, which have these upregulated phosphorus transport systems and how that's influencing arsenic on these sites. We have published a little bit of, on this, but really it, it's an area that needs a lot more work on how our native plant systems will in, influence what's happening um, in these arsenic-rich environments and how the arsenic and phosphorus is in, um, interacting to influence ecosystem health, but also um, arsenic mobility. Yeah, I imagine it's going to be quite a challenge to go to sort of full field scale, um, I guess, measurement of, you know, going from what you've identified in the lab to consequences of a rehabilitation approach at a whole of mine scale or that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, where our interest is really on the, more of those fundamental processes at this point, uh, but yeah, absolutely this needs to be expanded. So, of course, I did not do all of this work. I've been involved in all of it, and uh, I have lots of people to thank for their contributions to this finished and uh, still ongoing work. Um, they're on the screen, probably too many to to list, given we're probably <laughs> gone, gone a fair bit over time. Oh, you thank, you, thank you to my uh, We can my meet Lizzie. She's done a webinar before. Um, yeah. So there's more reading for people there. Yep. All right, we've got some early bird questions. Have you looked into in situ underwater treatment while Halla has flooded tunnels and lots of arsenopyrite prohibiting dewatering? Oh, uh, well, the short answer the short answer is no. Um, no, I haven't. Uh, but it sounds like a very complicated system and uh, these sorts of uh, adit and uh, tunneled systems are well known to be very problematic in terms of their arsenic management. I, I'm aware of some technologies uh, which I don't believe is widely adopted where some material can be sort of pumped in uh, to you know push out any sort of gas transfer into the systems, um, I'm not not 100 percent on really how successful they are uh, in the long term, but it sounds like a very complicated and interesting system. It's a nice place to visit as well. Um, in terms of biochar, have you seen that being used at all for any arsenic solutions? Yeah, biochar is an interesting one, and uh, at least in the academic literature, you'll find hundreds of papers now um, investigating the usefulness of, of arsenic in biochar. Um, biochar itself is a, a complicated material. It's basically like a soil. You know, eat, every biochar is almost different to another. Uh, so whether one's going to be useful really depends on what the starting material was and how it's being treated. A typical biochar, however, if it's a a pure biomass type material is going to be heavily carbon rich with a, uh, a lower amount of mineral component. And as a rule, those sort of oxygenated carbon functional groups like um, carboxylate is not very good at chemically stabilizing and reducing arsenic solubility because there's very little evidence to show that arsenic bonds to any of those functional groups. And that applies to organic matter. However, most of the most of the work that's done on biochar involves modifying that biochar um, to add material either on the surface or into the biochar that's going to be far more effective at recovering that. So if your material has a lot of mineral, it might be more useful. Uh, for example, an iron or aluminium type oxide. Uh, otherwise, it needs to be modified. Um, and I'm aware of 
research projects that investigated this, but I'm not, I'm personally not aware of any site that's actively using arsenic as a remediation strategy. And if it were, um, it's an interesting case study because I think biochar starts to fall into that humic acid category where some uncertainties uh, would exist on its influence on arsenic behaviour. I suppose it gets down to the level of, um, is it pyrolysis that produces biochar? Yeah, that's right. So temperature is another big factor. Um, but, yeah, there's so many biochars and they're not... They're not, not all the same. So it's a, it's a it's a diverse area of research. Okay. Um, so I've got a question here, which is sort of impact on water quality question, Mark. So I, I'm sort of a little bit interested in this too. So we talk a lot about arsenic and various states of arsenic, but in, in the scheme of things, so particularly with mine site wastes, is arsenic itself entering surface waters, you know, a big issue versus, you know, maybe mobilisation of copper? Or... Uh, certainly, certainly is. Uh, I've been to a number of sites where the arsenic has been enriched above, above several guidelines, but particularly drinking water guidelines. Obviously, our drinking water guidelines are relatively low. Um, maybe they'll go down in the future. However, who knows? But um, certainly arsenic does get washed off a lot of uh, older sites and uh, does make its way into the ground, whether water, uh, groundwater and surface water, um, regardless of that's a groundwater recharge or a surface, surface water charge. But I think there are many documented sites, even just in Australia, where this is this is the case. And the arsenic would be the key contaminant driver, would it? Or is yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Well, most likely because uh, once it gets into a, a, a river system, the river system's probably relatively high pH and a lot of the cations are probably either absorbed onto particulates or settled out as particulates. Um, but human health and ecological systems are quite different, so... Uh, things like copper are going to be drivers of probably eco ecological risk, whereas things like arsenic would be a bigger driver as a generalization um, than other other metals such as lead, where they tend to be very strongly absorbed at those higher pHs. Okay. Um, next question is an interesting one is phytoremediation a viable option for managing areas affected by arsenic and specifically what species of arsenic so you've certainly discussed this a bit sort of raises a couple of questions in my mind that like often yeah. you're planting vegetation to control water movements as much as uh, anything to do with the chemistry reactions you sort of seem to have a we have a bit of a dilemma, don't we? We're, we're using the plants to maybe create a transpiration cap, but we're also increasing organics that might be mobilising the contaminants. Um, what's your view on the question? Yeah, well, it depends what they're meaning by from phytoremediation. So from a phyto extraction point of view, um, I'm probably on the side of it's not currently a viable option uh, for, for most sites, but that really depends on, on the site. Um, it's something that takes a lot of time, so the landowners um, and the managers will need to, need to have a lot of time on their hands for it to become effective. Um, some, some estimates are we're talking about dozens to hundreds of years for, for really fighter remediation to, to, be, to be effective. Uh, depending on the environmental standards that are needing to be achieved. However, you know, in some systems it may work, but if we're talking about phytostabilization, which is the more common approach, then yes, it does have does have potential um, in in reducing particulate movement and, as you've mentioned, uh, limiting water flow through through these systems. Um, 
but I guess that is the, really the question, and you know, we're really at the stage of of our our lab investigations um, and what impact uh, these plant communities are going to have. Uh, but we'd be quite interested in looking at a larger field scale type setting to see how how fighter remediation, whether that is fighter stabilization or other, um, has an impact on on rehabilitation of these sites. But it's a it's a complicated question, um, and I think the answer uh, is really open to interpretation still. But uh, yeah, there are big differences though between the different strategies. Uh, I think it definitely has a place. All right. Next question: How does the presence of acid sulfate impact the management of arsenic in spoil? Yeah, well, this is an interesting question, um, and it's a long, probably long answer. But I'll try to keep it brief. So, an unmodified acid uh, sulfate system will probably mean some of those key minerals, such as the shrapnelite, toluite, scorodites, <clears throat> et cetera, are probably relatively stable if, if they're untouched. They're still going to be releasing arsenic. Um, but if you are then going to try and modify what's happening in, the, in those waste materials, then those minerals, again, whether you're changing the redox or not, is going to potentially be changed. So some of those minerals um, that are the most commonly observed, so our scorodites and potentially amorphous ferric arsenate, they don't like, they're not stable once the pH starts to get into the range that, that we like to see for a productive soil. So if we start increasing the pH in those acid sulfate systems up into the six, seven range, those minerals become less and less stable and start to decompose um, and new minerals are going to have to take up the place for those arsenic. So how you manage your acid sulfate system um, really is going to have a big influence on what happens to arsenic. Um, but I mean, this is a this is a you know 20 year research question in, in some ways to really answer the question, but um, yeah, that's my sh the short answer to my to the question. All right, last question of the early bird questions, and then we'll check if there's any questions on the Q&A. Addressing multiple redox states to effectively design treatment approaches beyond blending, just click that, to dilute, dilute to meet guideline values. Yeah, so. well, I mean, both both oxidation states that we expect to see in source solution, uh, in solution, uh, so arsenic-3 and arsenic-5, they both adsorb uh, to a host of minerals, whether that be iron, aluminium, or manganese oxides or other. Arsenic-5 is known to be more adsorbed, so I think that's really where the question is coming from. Um, so there are arsenic-3 is able to be oxidised, um, and so that could, instead of looking at a, a mixed redox state, uh, if there's a potential for adding a component of your system that is able to oxidize the arsenite into a into a uh, system that can oxidize to arsenate, then then you can treat it predominantly as a single redox state. So where we could look at techniques, uh, whether that be adsorption processes of arsenate or co-precipitation, um, that would probably be, be the way to do it. Um, otherwise, uh, if, if you have the time and the resources, you could design adsorbents that are, are good for each of those two oxidation states. So arsenite tends to like to bond uh, more strongly to certain functional groups, um, whereas arsenate others. So if you had a mixed mixed adsorbate system, um, that could be another way to deal with the mixed redox state. Okay. We're on to the Q&As. We've got a couple of questions here from Rod Harwood. Have you completed any projects where you have sparged arsenic in groundwater from or down gradient of a tailings dam 
to change the toxicity of the arsenic in connection with iron precipitation? Again, the short answer is no. I unfortunately have not done such an exciting uh, project. Um, but it would certainly help under those reducing conditions where the iron two is driving what's happening with both the iron geochemistry and the arsenic. Uh, once you have those, how to, that's assuming that you don't have a good sulfide system that can remove the arsenic from from so, uh, from the from the solution. If you can somehow drive sulfide formation in that system, it might be a might be a potentially a better approach than uh, air spargy. I've certainly seen that done um, up around Ballarat, I think it was. Um, I'm always a little bit intrigued with like, so we do all this air sparging and that sort of thing and we change that state, but how permanent is that transformation in the environment, you know? Will it go back the other way again over time? In groundwater systems, I think there's there's a high potential for that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is really what's driving what happens in Bangladesh, where there's a there's been a change from the formation of those aquifer materials to current time, and that's what's really causing that that arsenic release. It's not actually it's not actually increased arsenic inputs; it's changes to the the uh, geochemistry in those aquifers. So, in a groundwater system, it could quite quite easily occur. Yeah. So in those rice paddies, like you start off with a totally wet bed and then it dries out over time, is that sort of arsenic availability changing every year? And is that, yep. like it's quite an interesting thing, right? You need all that food to eat. But um, is that what's loading up the arsenic in the groundwater or the groundwater is just already loaded up with arsenic anyway in places like Bangladesh? Yeah, the arsenic's coming from a reductive dissolution process is the common common explanation for what's happening there in the groundwater. Um, the The downside is that the, it's been the groundwater's essential for, for the farming and, and, you know, life in Bangladesh. So I'm in those, in those rice paddies, that's exactly what happens. There's big seasonal changes in the, in the iron arsenic chemistry. It's been very well documented. Um, and uh, if anyone wants to have a look, they'll be able to find many papers showing the big oscillations in iron arsenic and redox chemistry in those systems. Okay. Last question uh, is from an anonymous attendee. How was the pH adjusted and monitored during the experiments? The pH was done using a pH buffer. Um, and that was, so at low pH, there was no pH buffer used. Um, at the higher pHs, we used MES and a buffer called TES, which is quite common for these types of experiments. Um, and once, once we adjusted the pH uh, before adding the solution, it was basically, we, we checked it for the whole 80 days and there was no change under any of the treatments, even the even the pH 3 was, yeah, it was good news that the pH stayed very stable the whole, whole time. Very good. Well, Dane, that brings us to the end of the questions. So I just wanted to thank you very much for presenting on this today. I think my reflections are that rehabilitation of mine sites might be getting a whole lot more complicated. But um, really appreciate um, you presenting here today. Thank you, Richard, and thank you. Thanks again for having me. Thanks, everybody.